Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is evident that a Christian who would spend Septuagesima according to the spirit of the church must make war upon that false security, that self-satisfaction, which is so common to effeminate and tepid souls. It is well for them that if these delusions do not insensibly lead them to the absolute loss of the true Christian spirit. Dear friends in Christ, it seems that the joy we experienced at the crib with our dear baby Jesus has passed all too quickly. And now the church, in unveiling herself in violet and removing the glory and the alleluia, seems to have cast a shadow again over our celebrations. It's mere weeks, really, since we celebrated his glorious birth, and yet all too soon, it seems we are starting to prepare for his awful death. <laughs> Last week, the week of Septuagesima, the lessons in the night hours of the divine office that are prayed by clergy and religious focused on Adam and on the dreadful act of our first parents and the consequences of that sin for the entire human race. This week of Sexagesima, the lessons in the night hours concern Noah, how he typifies or prefigures our Lord. In a time when the world was immersed in sin and when even Almighty God himself had lamented that he, he had created man and sought to destroy him, one man in the person of Noah was found just before him. Now today's mask speaks to us of a mystery even more profound but related. As Noah gave physical birth to the new people desired by God. Under the new covenant, it is the word of God brought to us in the flesh by Christ in the gospel that now gives spiritual birth to the new people, to the church. Now, as we discussed recently, the object of these weeks of preparation before Lent is to move us to make sure we are part of that people that Christ came to establish, to use the graces that, like those of Advent, are available to us and by escaping the deluge of worldliness that now again plagues the world and remain sheltered in the ark of salvation. If God desired to destroy the world during the time of Noah, one can only imagine how he sees it now while it gasps for breath and sinks under a new paganism and a revitalized and emboldened communism. It is for this end that the church presents to us the parable of the sower. The church fathers remind us that there is almost no need for a commentary or interpretation of the text, for our Lord gives it to us himself. The seed is the word of God, the gospel and the preaching of it. The earth is the free will of those who hear it. The sun, grace that illuminates and inflames the will to produce good fruits from that gospel. The winds are temptations which, by agitating the seeds, cause them to take deeper root and be strengthened. Our Lord is telling us that he himself is, of course, the sower, preaching the gospel on earth, but that this teaching has markedly different receptions. Not all who hear it accept it. Not all who do believe preserve it. Not even all who preserve it bring forth good fruit from it. All such things happen not through fault with the seed or the sower, the doctrine of the gospel, but through the fault of the earth, the will of those that hear it. By the presentation of this gospel at such a key moment in the liturgical year, the preparation for Lent and the coming redemptive sufferings of our Savior, we should be moved to ask ourselves which category we fall into. Such questions and their inevitable answers are difficult. It can be painful to see the deep-rooted faults and obstacles that we have to the grace that our Lord climbs the awful hill of Calvary to give us. And yet, those honest answers are like gold, especially in a time of preparation like this. 
for they will help arm us with the necessary tools to be able to truly climb Calvary with him and be able to catch the drops of blood that he sheds for us so as to be able to truly benefit from them and not let them fall to the ground needlessly. And yet, in order to heed the warning from our opening quote, that it is evident that the Christian must make war upon the false security, the self-satisfaction, which are so common to tepid and effeminate souls, we must take the opportunity that the church presents to us here and seriously examine whether we are in fact that good soil that our Lord urges us to be. Perhaps we do listen to the word of God and that it is pleasing to us, and perhaps it even takes root for a time, but is only stifled and strangled further down the road with repeated falls in the same areas, a lack of zeal or even a lukewarmness in our practices, a failure to benefit and be moved by the church in her different liturgical seasons. Now within the gospel, our Lord makes a seemingly strange statement about the nature of his teaching. To you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to the rest in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing may not understand. St. Thomas Aquinas and St. John Chrysostom both tell us that our Lord here refers to the disposition of his listeners. By parables does our Lord use simple and familiar language to convey his divine instructions. He uses natural objects to teach supernatural realities. They are of their nature, designed to enlighten the mind, but are also designed to ensure that only those who are well disposed and make the effort to apply themselves will find their true meaning. So those that are blinded by their own hardened wills, they will not see, they will not hear, nor make the effort needed to understand them. The emphasis here is on disposition and effort. Again and again, we are reminded throughout the year that the work of our salvation is, of course, the hardest work we will ever do, but we absolutely must do it. We must take the trouble and apply ourselves to make sure that we are or that we become that good soil that reaps a hundredfold from the word of God and to seriously ask what struggles choke the word of God in us. As part of our efforts, which take place in reflection, in examination, in self-honesty, it's worth us looking at our previous Septuagesimas, our previous Lents, and ask how much preparation we have put in in previous years and how fruitful that preparation was. How is it possible for us to make this Lent, this year, more fruitful than all the ones previous to it? What is it that we can do? What fault can we attack more earnestly? What practices will be best tailored to this goal? that we do become the good soil the sower dies for us to be. Remembering, of course, that he deliberately takes on the most dreadful sufferings and humiliations and dies for us in order to cleanse us from those sins and draw us to himself, if we are to share in and receive what he is literally dying to give us, we must follow him, suffer with him, and carry our crosses with him, and even die with him, even though that death be spiritual, if not physical. Through the sacred liturgy, the mass and the divine office, he urges us before our penances of Lent properly begin to consider the wounds caused in the soul by sin. In a certain sense, we are here called to do what we normally do, to lament over our sins, to thank God for his mercy, to beg for the graces that we need, but to do it more earnestly and to gain that knowledge of ourselves that will help us tailor our Lenten practices and strive to obtain the virtues that we need. Now, lest we think that we are doing enough with our spiritual practices or that we are already holy enough that we won't struggle with our faith when we, are, when we leave home or college, that we don't need to practice mental prayer or that it's for other people more holy and more devout, that this or that particular fault can be corrected in future lengths, we need only remind ourselves of what dear St. Augustine tells us regarding the spiritual life. That like the man rowing the boat against the current of a river, not to be going forward is, of course, to be going backwards. Now, with these considerations in mind, we should spend the next two weeks in considering the Lenten practices that we should take on. They would normally consist in three things. Some added prayer devotion, some mortification, and some type of almsgiving if possible. Now remember, when we have talked about the striving for holiness, we've often made reference to the tools that are used to do this. And two of the main tools, along with devout reception of the sacraments, are prayer and penance and mortification. 
By prayer, of course, we call down the graces necessary for us. And by penance, we cooperate with those graces. Let us remember the difference then between penance and mortification. That penance is the offering up of the day-to-day -day sufferings that our Lord permits us to suffer so that we can atone for our past sins. Mortification, on the other hand, is the voluntary taking on of difficulties in order to regulate our inclinations to sin in the present. They are both related but distinct. So penance then is to atone for our past sins. Mortification is to control our inclination to sin now in the present. Non-Catholics will often criticize such practices, scoffing, oh, the Catholics think they can go to heaven by giving up chocolate cake, not realizing that, in a sense, that is, in fact, true. By regulating our inclinations to licit things, as we've often said, we strengthen our wills to resist illicit things that are often far more tempting. In Lent, the Holy Ghost, in his masterful psychology, has us do both, to call for the graces we need by prayer and to cooperate with them by penances and mortification. And yet, like a man planning to climb a mountain, or in fact, to start any difficult task, it has to be done with preparation. And so, in these last two weeks, we should be thinking of and praying about what practices and prayers and penances we will, we will do for this period. Remember, in fact, that old favorites are in many ways some of the best, regulating our eating of things that we like, sugar and sweet things, regulating our use of the internet and technology, something that many of us need and something that can consume an inordinate amount of time, adding, adding prayer like the litany of the precious blood or of litany of humility and so on. All of these practices can be very fruitful with the right dispositions. As we said, Self-examination, reflection, seeking of the obstacles of weaknesses is difficult. Our proud nature finds it repugnant. We naturally want to leave such things to future lengths or not at all. And so it is fitting that we ask, of course, for help. First of all, from the Saviour who is born, who comes to sow, but also to suffer and to die, that when he finally reaps, that you, you, his beloved, you, the one he thought of before time began, you who he called by name into existence, will remain with him for all eternity. This is, of course, why he goes to such effort to teach us these mysteries. Why he, as St. Alphonsus reminds us, he is impatient for his suffering and for his cross. Why he longed for them for his entire life, so that you will be united to him for eternity. And then we turn to the Blessed Virgin. It is by her fiat that our Lord became man, of course. It is because of her pure love of God and desire to serve him that we are able to welcome the newborn king into our crib. And it is with her intercession that we will be able to ask those difficult questions about our place in the field, our relationship with her son, the sower. And we, and, <laughs> and we need to, as what we need to do as we approach Calvary with him, as we approach Lent. Let us pray to her in these remaining weeks that we are able to truly see whether the seed that is cast by the sower is well rooted in us, whether it brings forth good fruits, not just for a time, but continually, and in what form the thorns strangle and choke it in us, so that we can and will be able to tailor our Lenten practices to attack just these things. She, while not sorrowful on account of her own sins, of course, she didn't have them, was and is sorrowful on account of the sins of mankind, of how they deeply offend her son, and also how they lead to the terrible loss of so many souls. And because of this, she is filled with the desire to help us in our struggles, and never fails to intercede for us, as she did recently at the manger, and how she will do again for us as we prepare to approach Calvary with her son, the sower. What then is the thorn that strangles the seed in your heart? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.